The following is an excerpt from Lectures on Literature by Vladimir Nabokov, published 1980. A Phenomenon of Style Please completely forget, disremember, obliterate, unlearn, consign to oblivion any notion you may have had that Jekyll and Hyde is some kind of a mystery story, a detective story, or movie. It is, of course, quite true that Stevenson's short novel, written in 1885, is one of the ancestors of the modern mystery story. But today's mystery story is the very negation of style, being, at the best, conventional literature. Frankly, I am not one of those college professors who coyly boasts of enjoying detective stories. They are too badly written for my taste and bore me to death, whereas Stevenson's story is, God bless his pure soul, lame as a detective story. Neither is it a parable nor an allegory, for it would be tasteless as either. It has, however, its own special enchantment if we regard it as a phenomenon of style. It is not only a good bogey story, as Stevenson exclaimed when awakening from a dream in which he had visualized it much in the same way, I suppose, as magic celebration had granted Coleridge the vision of the most famous of his unfinished poems. It is also, and more importantly, a fable that lies nearer to poetry than to ordinary prose fiction, and therefore belongs to the same order of art as, for instance, Madame Bovary or Dead Souls. There is a delightful whiny taste about this book. In fact, a good deal of old mellow wine is drunk in the story. One recalls the wine that Utterson so comfortably sips. This sparkling and comforting draught is very different from the icy pangs caused by the chameleon liquor, the magic regent that Jekyll brews in his dusty laboratory. Everything is very appetizingly put. Gabriel John Utterson of Gaunt Street mouths his words most roundly. There is an appetizing tang about the chill morning in London, and there is even a certain richness of the tone in the descriptions of the horrible sensations Jekyll undergoes during his Haydnizations. Stevenson had to rely on style very much in order to perform the trick, in order to master the two main difficulties confronting him. One, to make the magic potion a plausible drug based on a chemist's ingredients, and two, to make Jekyll's evil side before and after hydnization a believable evil. Three important points are completely obliterated by the popular notions about this seldom read book. One, is Jekyll good? No, he is a composite being, a mixture of good and bad, a preparation consisting of 99% solution of Jekyllite and 1% of Hyde. Jekyll's morals are poor from a Victorian point of view. He is a hypocritical creature carefully concealing his little sins. He is vindictive, never forgiving Dr. Lanyon, with whom he disagrees in scientific matters. He is foolhardy. Hyde is mingled with him, within him. In this mixture of good and bad, in Dr. Jekyll, the bad can be separated as Hyde, who is a precipitate of pure evil, a precipitation in the chemical sense, since something of the composite Jekyll remains behind to wonder and horror at Hyde while Hyde is in action. 2. Jekyll is not really transformed into Hyde, but projects a concentrate of pure evil that becomes Hyde, who is smaller than Jekyll, a big man, to indicate the larger amount of good that Jekyll possesses. 3. There are really three personalities, Jekyll, Hyde, and a third the Jekyll residue when Hyde takes over. If you look closely at Hyde, you will notice that above him floats a ghast but dominating, a residue of Jekyll, a kind of smoke ring or halo, as if this black concentrated evil had fallen out of the remaining ring of good. But this ring of good still remains. Hyde still wants to change back to Jekyll. This is a significant point. It follows that Jekyll's transformation implies a concentration of evil that already inhabited him, rather than a complete metamorphosis. Jekyll is not pure good, and Hyde, Jekyll's statement to the contrary, is not pure evil. For just as parts of unacceptable Hyde dwell within acceptable Jekyll, so over Hyde hovers a halo of Jekyll, horrified at his worser half's iniquity. The relations of the two are typified by Jekyll's house which is half Jekyll and half Hyde. Stevenson has set himself a difficult artistic problem, and we wonder very much if he is strong enough to solve it. 
Let us break it up into the following points. 1. In order to make the fantasy plausible, he wishes to have it pass through the minds of matter-of-fact persons, Utterson and Enfield, who even for all their commonplace logic must be affected by something bizarre and nightmarish in Hyde. 2. These two stolid souls must convey to the reader something of the horror of Hyde, but at the same time they, being neither artists nor scientists, unlike Dr. Lanyon, cannot be allowed by the author to notice details. 3. Now if Stevenson makes Enfield and Utterson too commonplace and too plain, they will not be able to express even the vague discomfort Hyde causes them. On the other hand, the reader is curious not only about their reactions, but he wishes also to see Hyde's face for himself. 4. But the author himself does not see Hyde's face clearly enough, and could only have it described by Enfield or Utterson in some oblique, imaginative, suggestive way, which, however, would not be a likely manner of expression on the part of these stolid souls. I suggest that given the situation and the characters, the only way to solve this problem is to have the aspect of Hyde cause in Enfield and Utterson not only a shudder of repulsion, but also something else. I suggest that the shock of Hyde's presence brings out the hidden artist in Enfield and the hidden artist in Utterson. Critics such as Stephen Gwynne have noticed a curious flaw in the story's so-called familiar and commonplace setting. Quote, there is a certain characteristic avoidance. The tale as it develops might almost be one of a community of monks. Mr. Utterson is a bachelor, so is Jekyll himself. So by all indications is Enfield, the younger man who first brings to Utterson a tale of Hyde's brutalities. So for that matter is Jekyll's butler, Poole, whose part in the story is not negligible. Excluding two or three vague servant maids, a conventional hag, and a faceless little girl running for a doctor, the gentle sex has no part in the action. It has been suggested that Stevenson, working as he did under Victorian restrictions, and not wishing to bring colors into a story alien to its monkish pattern, consciously refrained from placing a painted feminine mask upon the secret pleasures in which Jekyll indulged. This Victorian reticence prompts the modern reader to grope for conclusions that perhaps Stevenson never intended to be groped for. For instance, Hyde is called Jekyll's protege and his benefactor, but one may be puzzled by the implication of another epithet attached to Hyde, that of Henry Jekyll's favorite, which sounds almost like a minion. The all-male pattern that Gwynne has mentioned may suggest by a twist of thought that Jekyll's secret adventures were homosexual practices so common in London behind the Victorian veil. Utterson's first supposition is that Hyde blackmails the good doctor, and it is hard to imagine what special grounds for blackmailing there would have been in a bachelor's consorting with ladies of light morals. Or do Utterson and Enfield suspect that Hyde is Jekyll's illegitimate son, paying for the capers of his youth, is what Enfield suggests. But the difference in age as implied by the difference in their appearance, does not seem to be quite sufficient for Hyde to be Jekyll's son. Moreover, in his will, Jekyll calls Hyde his friend and benefactor, a curious choice of words, perhaps bitterly ironic, but hardly referring to a son. In any case, the good reader cannot be quite satisfied with the mist surrounding Jekyll's adventures, and this is especially irritating since Hyde's adventures, likewise anonymous, are supposed to be monstrous exaggerations of Jekyll's wayward whims. Now the only thing we do guess about Hyde's pleasures is that they are sadistic. He enjoys the infliction of pain. In his essay, A Gossip on Romance, Stevenson has this to say about narrative structure. Quote, the right kind of thing should fall out in the right kind of place. The right kind of thing should follow and all the circumstances in a tale answer one another like notes in music. The threads of a story come from time to time together and make a picture in a web. The characters fall from time to time into some attitude to each other or to nature, which stamps the story home like an illustration, Crusoe recoiling from the footprint, Emma smiling under the iridescent sunshade, Anna reading the shop signs along the road to her death. These are the culminating moments in the legend, and each has been printed on the mind's eye forever. Other things we may forget. We may forget the author's comment, although 
perhaps it was ingenious and true, but these epoch-making scenes which put the last mark of artistic truth upon a story and fill up at one blow our capacity for artistic pleasure, we so adopt into the very bosom of our mind that neither time nor tide can efface or weaken the impression. This, then, is the highest, the plastic part of literature, to embody character, thought, or emotion in some act or attitude that shall be remarkably striking to the mind's eye." End quote. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, as a phrase, has entered the language for just the reason of its epoch-making scene, the impression of which cannot be effaced. The scene is, of course, the narrative of Jekyll's transformation into Mr. Hyde, which, curiously, has the more impact in that it comes as the explanation contained in two letters after the chronological narrative has come to an end. I would like to say a few words about Stevenson's last moments. As you know by now, I am not one to go on heavily for the human interest stuff when speaking of books. Human interest is not in my line, as Ronsky used to say. But books have their destiny, according to the Latin tag, and sometimes the destinies of authors follow those of their books. There's old Tolstoy in 1910 abandoning his family to wander away and die in a station master's room to the rumble of passing trains that had killed Anna Karenin. And there is something in Stevenson's death in 1894 on Samoa, imitating in a curious way the wine theme and the transformation theme of his fantasy. He went down to the cellar to fetch a bottle of his favorite burgundy, uncorked it in the kitchen, and suddenly cried out to his wife, What's the matter with me? What is this strangeness? Has my face changed? And fell on the floor. A blood vessel had burst in his brain, and it was all over in a couple of hours. What? Has my face changed? There is a curious thematical link between this last episode in Stevenson's life and the fateful transformation in his most wonderful book.